everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Science Friday live stream. I'm so excited that you are here. Thank you so much for joining us, no matter where you are joining from. I am here from um, cooling down finally, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, so if you want to let us know where you are joining us from tonight, uh, you can sign into YouTube uh, and join us in the chat. It's either to the side or just below us. So a few people are already starting to let us know where they are from. We have people joining from San Francisco, uh, San Clarita, Ohio, Baltimore, Rochester, Illinois, Kansas City, Pennsylvania, Sacramento, and a whole bunch more. So thank you so much for letting us know and for joining us tonight. If you don't know Science Friday, we are your one-stop shop for all things science news. We are probably best known for our radio broadcast, which happens every, you guessed it, Friday from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern. You can listen on our radio pro uh, to our radio program on your local NPR station, but also go to sciencefriday.com and just find out everything that's going on on our website. But today, we're not talking about that. Instead, we're talking about the Science Friday Book Club has been reading a really great book this month. It is called The Kaiju Preservation Society by John Scalzi. And we have John with us tonight. So he's going to be joining us in just a minute. Um, if you want to join fellow readers to discuss this and our other book picks, by the way, we have an online community space. So I will drop the link in the chat for that in just a few moments so that you can join us there. It's a great place. We have discussion questions, we post related articles, we talk about the books that we're reading. It's a really fun place and you don't even have to leave your home to join our community there. So I hope that you will join us there. A kind reminder before we get started, Science Friday is committed to providing a welcoming and harassment-free environment for members of all ethnicities, ages, gender and trans statuses, sexual orientations, physical abilities, national origins, beliefs, and any other dimension of diversity. We've created a code of conduct, which you can watch on, uh, you can find the entirety of on our community space. Um, and that helps us create a safe and positive experience for everybody and believe that providing clear expectations is a necessary part of building a respectful community. So here are the basics and I've also put them in the chat. Be supportive and respectful when speaking with one another or asking questions in the comments. Listen closely and share generously. You can add thoughts throughout, even if they aren't strictly questions. Again, people are doing that in the chat right now and they're doing a great job. We're going to try our best to stay on topic tonight because we're here to discuss this month's book club pick, which again is the Kaiju Preservation Society and related topics. Sometimes we get a little offhand, but your questions should be um, somewhat related to the book that we have read this month together. And we reserve the right to ban anyone who engages in demeaning, discriminatory or harassing behavior in the chat today. So keep that in mind. All right. Thank you for sticking with me. That is all the stuff I have to do before I welcome our special guests to the stage. So please... Take a moment in the chat, put some claps, put some hearts, and welcome our guest. Hi, John. John is John Scalzi, <laughs> is New York Times best-selling author, uh, an award-winning author who has taken home multiple prizes, including the Hugo, the Locust, the Audi, the uh, Robert A. Heinlein, the Swin, and the Kurd Laswitz Award. I should have run all of those pronunciations by you before I said them all, but you may know him better for his Old Man's War series, or like I said, the Kaiju Preservation Society, which was the Science Friday Book Club pick for this month. Uh, and we're so excited to have you here, John. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for everybody who was wondering, I, was, I, I mentioned that I would come in with this face so that we would be very excited and stuff. Uh, also, also, just to warn you, every once in a while, this door may open it's not a poltergeist. It's <laughs> one of several pets uh, wanting my attention. My dog was here just literally like 10 seconds ago, looking up at me going, take me out, take me out now. And I'm like, really? Now you had all this time and now is when you're telling me to take you out. So they're very good at knowing when we're busy people and right, um, exactly. And it's like talking to people. I, I feel that she was literally on the other side of the door. She's like, wait for it, wait for it, go. So. Well, uh, if they join us, please let them us uh, know their names and give us a little, little wave for them. In, oh, in absolutely. Space. absolutely. So, John, thank you again so much for being here. Uh, we have so enjoyed reading your book together. Uh, people were wondering what we were going to read together this summer. And I told them we're going to sort of take a break for some of the deep dives we've done on various science topics. Um, and 
uh, have a whole lot of fun with your book. Uh, right. It was also suggested a few months ago um, by one of our readers. I believe it was Riley Black who suggested your book as a really great summer beach read. So, oh, excellent. Um, I, yeah, so I took her suggestion and read it myself and I was like, this is great, we're gonna have a great fun. So um, a reminder to our audience that if you have questions at any time throughout the live stream, put them in the chat. I am keeping a list of the questions so far and we're gonna get to as many as we can tonight. But we're gonna start off with, with one of my questions, which is, I, mm -hmm. I, you know, we talked a little bit about the book so far, but I just wanna hear from you. What, what, how does this book sort of fit in? What, what happens in Kaiju Preservation Society? even for maybe for people who haven't read it yet, how do you get yeah. people excited about the book, but also how does it fit in with your other writing? I don't think it necessarily fits in with the other writing at all. I mean, <laughs> it, it was it was an accidental novel. I was writing an entirely different novel in 2020 um, and it was going to be a dark and gritty political thriller in space. Um, mm. and, and as it turns out, the 2020 was not the best year to be writing a dark and gritty political thriller about anything, uh, much less in space. Um, and I just couldn't manage to get that book done. Um, mm. and I had to actually say to my editor, I, I failed. I can't, I, this book is not working. Uh, and they were, they had literally took that book off the schedule. And, uh, and then just when I thought uh, for the first time ever, I would have blown a deadline. Um, my brain was like, oh, while you were panicking about that book that you would never, ever, ever write. I was thinking about a completely different book and here it is, Kaiju <laughs> Preservation Society. And it really just downloaded into my brain. Um, so in many ways, I it was unplanned in, in almost every uh, sense. That said, there are, two, there are some similarities to what I've done before, for example, uh, in Agent to the Stars or in Red mm. Shirts where um, I like to call those sort of my contemporary novels uh, where an ordinary person confronts an extremely high concept idea. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, in Agent to the Stars, it's uh, aliens come uh, and they want to meet humanity so they get Hollywood representation. You know, for Red Shirts, it was uh, the people in a... Um, you know, on a spaceship, realize that they are the doomed characters in a in a not so great TV show. Um, and with Kaiju, it was really just thinking about um, everything that we know about Kaiju. Kaiju being like Godzilla, Rodan, you know, Gamera, all of those giant creatures uh, that wreck Tokyo on a on a really standard basis. And I was thinking about just the whole thing of how we think about them and how we encounter them um, and what they represent. And uh, one of the things that I really like doing is just taking tropes um, that are well established, like, you know, giant monsters and kind of uh, flipping them, turning them on mm -hmm. the head. So instead of what if the kaiju came to our world and, you know, wrecked things, it would be, well, why do, what would happen if we went to their world where they were just hanging out and, and living their best lives? And that was kind of the, the impetus for what was going on with the Kaiju Preservation Society. Yeah, I love that. Um, it was it was so fun getting to the end of the book and reading the afterword, which I, I don't always do, but you, sure. you know, you kind of caught me with your attention. You're like, I was writing a whole other book. Here's this other book. Yep. Um, so talk to us a little bit about why that was important as a story to tell as part of the afterword. Was there, was there any world in which you didn't tell us that story? No, I thought it was really important to tell that story. I mean, um, for a couple of reasons. The first is I do think that fair or not, people tend to think of authors as kind of a black bo box. Um, mm -hmm that you know, uh, text sort of extrudes out of them and then it extrudes on a regular basis. And, uh, you know, and it's only when that black box fails you know, that we notice, right? And you start banging on the box going, what's going on? Where's my extruded text? I need my extruded text. Uh, and uh, so I needed to, I, I wanted to explain to people that, you know, this book was a little bit not like all the other books that I, that I had done and how it happened. But the other thing was also, I wanted to talk to creative people. You know, it, it's one of those things that uh, people who don't do a lot of creative stuff, and I don't mean that as a disparagement, I just mean like on a day-to-day -day basis, that's not their gig. Often, I think, think that like, um, uh, challenging times will make for, uh, you know, challenging art, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
and that might be true, but it, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, I think writers and artists and creators do better when they have, uh, you know, the space, both mentally, physically, and otherwise, um, to think about their work and do their best work. And 2020 was, 2020 and 2021 um, were years where we had pandemics. We had, in the United States, we had uh, political upheaval and social upheaval, all of these things going on. Um, and nearly every single creative person I know um, was uh, distracted and torn from their usual creative process mm -hmm. um, by the events of, of the year. Um, and one of the things that I think was important is, for better or for worse, uh, I'm a well-known person in science fiction and fantasy and in, and in literature. I, I, uh, I'm a New York Times bestseller. I've won awards, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, and if I can say, look, 2020 threw me for a loop and I barely <laughs> escaped it with the skin of my teeth, um, I think it makes it easier for everybody else to go, yeah, no, that actually happened to me as well. I mean, literally nobody I know, with the exception of Brandon Sanderson and his four ridiculous doorstopper books, <laughs> thank you, Brandon, um, handled 2020 uh, in a way that was like, ooh, now I'm going to, you know, uh, get all my projects done. It was just literally, we're all sitting there hitting the repeat on our social media, finding out what horrible thing was happening next. And so um, making it clear that even though this book came out and it came out on the right schedule and all of that sort of stuff, um, that it was still uh, really hard. And it was really important to tell people that, you know, sometimes this stuff is really hard and you just, you know, and there's nothing wrong with it being really hard. We are, we are humans. We are not the black boxes people think we are. And yeah, sometimes it gets in our way. Yeah. I love that. It was definitely like a sort of mind opening part for, I was like, so into the, the, the world that I was like, Oh man, I got to step back into our world. Now I finished this book and I got sort of a glimpse into like yep. what it was like to write this book. So I, I really appreciated it. Yeah. Um, so James is a really great question that actually goes back to a question I was going to ask you as well. Sure. You're wondering, what is your favorite kaiju movie? And I was wondering too, did, was there like sort of a block of inspiration that inspired this book specifically? Well, the two book, uh, the two movies that are kind of my favorites um, for various reasons are actually mentioned in the book. It's the original uh, Godzilla, which is the 1954 movie, um, mm -hmm. and then Guillermo del Toro's Pacific Rim, um, mm -hmm. which I believe just had a 10th anniversary. Um, and for the uh, for the original Godzilla, um, a lot of it is just because this is the um, this is basically the establishing shot for the kai for the kaiju genre uh, of mm -hmm. films, um, and it's an extremely important film. Not just because it's like that's the first time we see someone in a big rubber suit stomping over Tokyo. Um, but because of everything that it represents um, as as a piece of art and as a moment in time for particularly Japanese cinema, right? Mm. Um, all the all the nuclear uh, angst and terror and confusion uh, of uh, of Japan uh, is basically poured into that movie, right? Mm. I mean, there's a reason why it struck such a chord uh, in Japan and then elsewhere when it uh, when it went other places. Um, and on one sense, it really is just a monster movie with a guy in a rubber suit stomping on cardboard versions of buildings. Uh, but on the other hand, it really is something else entirely. Um, and then with uh, Pacific Rim, um, it's just, it's the it's the ultimate, I'm a movie nerd and I'm paying homage to all the stuff that I love. And that's kind of Guillermo del Toro in and of himself. He is he is nothing if not a fan of cinema, right? Like all his films are very clear, uh, have very clear antecedents. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and he just, his enthusiasm was so infectious and the film is also just so completely ridiculous, right? Um, that I just, I just love it. Like there's the scene when they're, uh, you know, the Kaiju and the Jaeger are fighting in, uh, in Hong Kong and uh, they go way up in the sky and spoiler alert, but it's 10 years. So you've had your time, yeah. you know, uh, he slices the Kaiju in half with this sword that just sort of magically appears. He comes down, he's like, you know, burning on reentry, hits a soccer field, 
you know, stuff goes up everywhere. It's a mess. And I remember turning to my wife, Christine, and like, this is the best film ever because it just hits all those nerd buttons. Yeah. Um, so those were, those were the two films uh, very specifically that I was thinking of when I was thinking about the Kaiju Preservation Society. Now it's important to note that because um, the Kaiju Preservation Society doesn't take place mostly uh, in uh, Earth Prime, the pro Earth that we know, but in yeah. an alternate Earth. Um, again, I don't think that's a, really a spoiler. Um, that um, the action and the concerns that people have in both of those films are the same as the concerns that the people in in the books have. But uh, but honestly, you know, they are. They live in our culture. They understand what a kaiju is. They understand, um, you know, where where they're at. And in, and and in fact, the fact that the both of those movies are named is it's the first night of a new shift of workers at the um, you know the base uh, for the kaiju uh, preservation society. Uh, and as an opening tradition, they watch those two movies. Um, mm. That is taken specifically from. Um, down in the at the South Pole Station and at Arctica, there's mm -hmm. like 60 people who stay over for the winter there. Um, and the very first thing they do once they shove everybody off and, you know, and then they're basically trapped for the next three months is they watch The Thing. 1982 is The Thing. Perfect. Right? Yeah. And you're just <laughs> like, well, and one, what's wrong with you people? And two, perfect. Right. Just like. Yeah. You, you have to give your nightmarish new surroundings a thing right, to sort of project exactly. onto the, so yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, no, that would never happen here. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of, so so you talked just now a little bit so about the science fiction inspiration, but about the science inspiration, the yeah. kaiju themselves. So you, you sort of, when you describe them in the book, there's sort of these ecosystems and yeah. um, there's, you know, they essentially have like a whole world sort of living on them, but like this whole other mystery happening inside of them. That sure. is like part of what happens in the book. So um, yeah. what was, what was the process like of sort of developing their physicality and the like ecosystemness of the Kaiju? Cause that's totally different than what we've seen in the past with those types of creatures. Right. Well, I mean, the thing about Kaiju or any creature that is, 150 to 200 meters large, right? Um, that you absolutely have to confront, right? Is that they're just physically impossible. Uh, yeah. In earth gravity, they just don't work. They're, they're, gonna, they're gonna collapse into a pile of, of goo and it's the square cube law, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so um, one of the things that I wanted to do um, is as much as possible, as much as possible make the science of the world that I was creating as plausible um, as it could be um, so that when you finally like you know, kind of launch off, um, then uh, then people are like, okay, I have, I have grounding for it and we can go from there. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I knew that I would absolutely have to confront is that square cube law, right? Mm -hmm. Because everybody in the book, almost everybody in the book is a scientist, right? Yeah. Almost everybody there is, and they they all know about the square cube law. They're not just going to be like, oh, maybe it doesn't work over here. No, it absolutely does work. Um, so when you have decided that you are going to actually obey the laws of physics to, to a certain extent, let's be very <laughs> clear, um, then you have to be like, well, now you got to rationalize this. And the ways that I that I rationalize them are, are two ways. One, what is the power source? for uh for the kaiju it cannot it cannot be just regular metabolism it can't just mm -hmm. be regular respiration it, all these sort of systems just don't work on that scale um so you have to figure out a whole new way to basically power that whole machine um and then it becomes the thing of well how do you make all that work besides that and that's basically mm -hmm. where the parasites and everything else um that inhabit this ecosystem that is the kaiju um, come from. And honestly, that's not that part, you know, the ecosystem of the kaiju is not that much of a, of a stretch because even we, and this is mentioned in the book as all, well, even we are basically aggregate creatures. We have, mm -hmm. uh, we have lots of species that live in and on uh, and near us. 
Um, and some of them are parasitic. Some of them are commensual. Um, if you don't have your gut flora, you're going to have a really bad time. Mm-hmm. Um, but in fact, they are not, they're not you, right? So, um, so you think of this, of this fact that basically all living creatures that are larger than paramecium are a system. Um, and there's no reason why a kaiju wouldn't be that sort of system as well. Um, scaled up because they mm-hmm. are that much larger. Um, now, uh, and so for me, that was the thing of putting in enough of uh, reasonableness. And I want to be very clear about the reasonableness is very, very stretchy here. Yeah. Um, that uh, so that when people were thinking about it, they'd be like, oh, OK, I can accept this for you are you are both observing the square cube law. And now you are giving this rationale. There are people who are like, you know, I have very many questions about how you were talking about how the power system worked here. You know, and that's perfectly fine. I mean, there's a reason why I leave so much of the the specifics of the science incredibly vague um, mm-hmm. for two reasons. Uh, the first being because. I have a degree in philosophy, right? You know, I don't have, I don't have a huge grounding in science, so I would just flub it. But the other thing is that uh, basically all the scientists and all the nerds and all the scientist nerds can think up something for themselves that will make that some, somehow vaguely function. And what they will think of is going to be so much better than what I could do. And they will come to me, you know, they were, I've, it's like, I figured out how you actually made that work and blah, they'll tell me what it is. And I'll be like, that's awesome. That's so close to what I was thinking, right? Yeah, of course. Uh, yes, exactly. That's exactly how that works. Yeah. Uh, that uh, and so that's but, but that's part of the fun of science fiction. Don't over explain it because uh, mm-hmm. then you'll get in trouble. But leave enough that they can speculate about it for on their own, and they will come up with what works for them. Um, and then you've won because they're like, okay, I don't, I'm not been thrown out by the bad science. I can just continue on. But absolutely, I wanted to. Um, take a look at a kaiju in a slightly different way where we're not just accepting that the square cube law doesn't work, right? We're mm-hmm. like, no, it works. I, yeah, you know, and so we're going to work with that. Yeah, I, I think it led to some like s- incredibly creative moments in your book. And I got to say, the kaiju are scary sounding. The parasites are uh, terrifying sounding. Oh, yeah. Every time no, I absolutely. pictured them, I was like, I do not like that. Yeah. No, no, no. There was a, there was a, there was actually, and I want to be very, uh, because someone will probably mention it in the comments. There was a, another kaiju movie um, that did talk about parasites in uh, in a significant way, aside from Pacific Rim, which actually mm-hmm. did uh, mm-hmm. go into that. Um, and that is uh, Cloverfield, where they mm-hmm. had the parasites dropping off and then attacking people and stuff like yeah. that. Um, uh, so I, I definitely had that in mind when I was thinking about my parasites, but my parasites, I have more parasites than, <laughs> Take that. than Cloverfield did. So there, because I have a whole ecosystem. So yeah. there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Jake has a question. How yeah. much research is there to do about Kaiju? It seems like there must be a lot. Well, I had an advantage, uh, in terms of the Kaiju, of uh, two things. Um, one, I used to be a film critic. So I have basically 30 years of film knowledge or, you know, writing about film at my fingertips, um, Mm -hmm. which makes it super easy to do the research because I just pull things out of my brain. Um, And then I also did a lot of science journalism. I mean, fun fact, I wrote an astronomy book uh, many years ago, uh, did a whole lot of writing for the Uncle John's uh, bathroom readers, where I was specifically their science guy. It's like, can you do us, can you write us an 800 word a piece about clouds. It's like, yes. Sure um, so, uh, so both of those meant that I had inherently a whole lot of just information that I could pull out of my head. Um, but beyond that, um, yeah, I mean, I, we live in, uh, in, in an age where so much information is at our fingertips that it makes it actually really easy to research. The irony of um, so much information exists, and yet we also live in an age of disinformation because not everybody is is uh, information literate. Is a whole other topic which we will not go into now because we are talking about this book. But uh, for me, it was it was great because I could call up um, you know some information about a particular kaiju or how they've done things or you know look at a YouTube clip of uh, of a movie so that I can make sure that I got it right. Um, but a lot of my research was not about specific kaiju, but since I was building my own kaiju by their own rules, um, 
just basically finding out ways to make that work and to go into information um, that that would seem to be uh, plausible. So there was a lot of research, but it wasn't necessarily the research I think everybody would think that the, that I had there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you talk a little bit in other interviews as uh, like you were able to draw on this in this knowledge of like this scientific knowledge. You don't have to do a lot of research about ecosystems right. because you have a lot of knowledge from your work as a science communicator talking about ecosystems and other science topics. Um, yeah. For other people who are hoping to maybe be a writer like that, where they can draw on that experience, mm -hmm. was there any sort of, besides having a job where you can do that, um, <laughs> is there any other like advice that you have for people? And like, all right, I, I really think I want to learn about this thing, how to sort of get entrenched in it while also keeping that, that goal of being a writer about this thing in their back pocket. Sure. I mean, I think the, the very first thing that helps, regardless of whatever it is that you do, is just to have uh, innate sense of curiosity and desire basically to have information come in um, at all times. I mean, I, uh, I constantly read. And I constantly read not just about like science or just about science fiction. Um, I astound my wife by the fact that we will go to like a family gathering and I will sit there and I will talk about sports uh, with the other dudes um, until the cows come home. And she's like, how do you do that? Why do you, how do you know that you don't like sports? Why do you, why? And I'm just like, I read it. It's part of the information flow that comes in because you never know when you're going to uh, want to, you know, when you're going to need that stuff. And basically whenever I go to family reunions, it's really helpful to know what's going on with Ohio state football. I mean, yeah. it, it just <laughs> is. Um, and, and so that's part of it, you know, just always have uh a huge, basically a fire hose of information, like pick your resources. Don't, you know, um, don't be going to low quality information sites. And again, this is about information literacy. Um, but what you're going to find out is that when you have just basically that constant inflow of interesting information, even if you aren't using it at any particular time, mm -hmm. it's going to rattle around in your brain. And also, um, when you do that, you start understanding the basically the infrastructure of information online and elsewhere. Like mm -hmm. you begin to learn how to find that information. You begin to learn uh, which sites are uh, reputable, which ones are not, how to create your searches so that you are um, making uh, good search queries so that you can find good and useful information, you know, absorbing it and, and using it uh, in those sorts of ways. I find that this sort of information literacy, aside from anything else, helps create a verisimilitude to your writing, particularly if you're writing contemporary stuff um, that you're just not going to get uh, otherwise. And I'll give an example of this. There is a scene in uh, Kaiju Preservation Society where uh, a, a group of people leave from um, BWI Airport in Baltimore uh, to go to an Air Force base, Thule Air Force Base that's in Greenland, right? Um, as it turns out, there is a specific flight in the real world that goes from BWI to Thule Base. It happens every week, mm -hmm. and it happens at the time that I had it leave um, BWI. And it arrived, and it arrived and on a very specific date, because I actually blocked, because it the, the book happens between March 2020 and March 2021. They travel on a specific day. That specific day, I looked up for Thule Base in Greenland, the weather conditions at the time that they would have been landing, right? Uh, and so that they, when they stepped off the plane, they were experiencing the world of Thule based the way that someone at Thule based did. Now, is anybody going to care about that? In one sense, no. On the other hand, there might be like three people in the world who are in Thule based hmm. who are reading my book being like, oh, my God, was he here? How did he find that information out? And this is what I mean by knowing that uh, what you're looking for, knowing how to find it, knowing to evaluate whether that information is good so that you can incorporate it into 
uh, your interests, no matter what it was. I mean, I have absolutely no reason to, on a day-to-day -day basis, know how to find information about the weather at Thule Base in uh, Greenland. But because of all the sort of just natural curiosity that I have as a, as a human, um, that information was easy for me to find and to put in the book and just make it that much more interesting and realistic. And I'm sure just having spoken to you now for about 30 minutes, uh, the fact that you put that in probably just made your brain happy. Like, Oh, it's, it's like absolutely <laughs> did. It's, it's very much like, it's very much an Easter egg. There are so many little things where you put them in and you're like, there may be nobody but me will know, but I do know. And I'm super happy that I got that right. I had that happen actually uh, in the new book where uh, Starter Villain, it takes place, part of it takes place in this town called Barrington, uh, Illinois. Um, and basically everything that I call out on uh, every street corner in Barrington Illinois exists, mm -hmm. right? Um, so if you are anybody here from Barrington, Illinois, when Starter Villain comes out next month, you're going to be astounded. You're like, I know where that place is. Oh, my yeah. God. So it's yeah. a delight. I mean, that's the thing is like it, those little um, Easter eggs. As a few people in our community space also mentioned the lamp shading moment in like oh, yeah. halfway through the book. People yeah. were like hilarious. Love it. Several people mentioned it. So yeah. you, got, you got a few fans that really loved that. So sweet. Um, We've got, this is why I love doing audience Q and A's by the way, because I spend, you know, an hour sort of like figuring out what questions I want to ask and doing research on past interviews. And then Dan comes sure. in and they say, if you were to be taken out by a kaiju, what circumstances would lead to your demise? And oh. I'm very curious. <laughs> I, you know, what would happen is I would just be like looking at the kaiju going, that's a big animal, isn't it? And I would basically be, eating. I'd be sitting there just like looking at it and being like, wow, I guess, okay, I guess this is how the physics of it work. Ah! Yeah. Uh, so, and, and I think that's what would be, it is that thing of curiosity kills the cat sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, they would basically, everybody would be telling me to run and I'd be like, but then I can't look at it. Yeah. You know, I need to see would... what the bottom of it foot, its foot looks like. Right, exactly. And uh, so that would that would be the thing that would get me. I mean, nobody actually believes that they're going to die until they die. And so I would be right until I would be like, oh, nope, that's a foot. No way to run from that. Oh, oh. All right. it, was a good, it was a good life. I saw yeah. it once. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because you're, so in the book, you know, these people, they go, they are hired, they go through a process of getting hired, they go to the base, they travel mm -hmm. to an alternate dimension, and land on uh, this alternate world. Um, sure. But there are tourists who come who yeah. could be in this very situation. Yeah. Um, yeah. And one of the things I wanted to ask you about, too, was the this idea of um, preservation and conservation. And they're yes. just like, they're very different they're similar, um, but preservation tends to be like, all right, we're going to leave that alone. And conservation is like, are right, going to help it so it can be closer to what it used to be. Right. Was was there a choice that you made there about the word preservation? Did it feel right when you were saying it? It came to you in this moment and you just kind of stuck with it. Did you have like a moment where you were thinking a little bit about those words? Well, uh, anybody who knows the band, The Kinks. Uh, mm -hmm. knows that there is the Village Green Preservation Society, right? Um, so that was just sort of a natural uh, thing for me, right? Mm -hmm. um, but as it turns out, it works out very well for uh, what the mission of the KPS is. Now, they do some sort of conservation effort stuff in the sense of um, they are, for example, at one point uh, helping uh, one kaiju uh, breed with another kaiju and all of that sort of stuff. There is the understanding that, um, you know, we we have a role in helping them do what they would normally do if they weren't just big, massive physics breaking pandas. Um, <laughs> but part of it as well is you're on an alternate version of Earth. Um, not only are you are you on an alternate version of Earth, but there is no scenario on this version of Earth where you not you are not an alien. The evolution of this planet did not include mammals, you know, among other uh, branches of, of mm -hmm. the tree of life. Um, so the, the job there is to observe and it is to do science. And it was very important to me, to me that we actually have the scientists do science and all that sort of stuff. Um, but also in a way that doesn't, um, intrude as much. You want to preserve 
the world as it exists as much as you can and not be a vector of infection and not be a vector of uh, invasion, of intrusion or any of that sort of stuff. And, and one of the reasons that I had um, the KPSB scientists is that of all groups of people, um, scientists will understand their place in the ecology of this world or in, in this universe um, better than uh, other folks will. They will not necessarily be looking at it going, do you know, this probably means that there are completely undeveloped oil fields here that we could absolutely exploit. That's not what they're there for. They are like, look, there's so much science to do and the science we can do here is going to be amazing. And we don't have to screw any of it up. We don't have to become billionaires uh, to, um, you know, to get, <laughs> yeah, or to, to get, to get the value of this world because the value mm -hmm. of this world is, is the knowledge of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was actually, like I said, really important for me to make that um, sort of statement that the, that the scientists would understand what they were doing there and why they were doing it. And, Part of it was also, you know, there is the other mission of let's make sure that we keep these creatures on that side of the fence, you know, mm -hmm. the trans-dimensional fence so they don't come in and, and cause problems over here. But again, that just leads into the mission of, you know, preserving not only the monsters over here, but the barrier that keeps them from coming over and wrecking havoc on the other side, which is where we are. Yeah. Well, you you depict the, this group of scientists in such a fun way. They've got such great dynamic between sure. them, the sort of core group that we meet, but also just kind of everyone working at this base. Was that different or similar to writing other sort of character groups like like soldiers or investigators or politicians? Like what was it like writing a group of different varying scientists? Uh, I mean, I think that personalities are personalities across the board, regardless mm -hmm. of what you do. And you are going to have some people who are, some are going to be smart asses. Some of them are going to be very earnest. Some of them are going to be accommodating. Some of them are going to be spiky. Um, so you will always have the great, you know, uh, hopefully panoply of, of personality types. Um, I, what I liked about the scientists is that uh, I could let the scientists be scientists and just really nerd out about science things Mm -hmm. Right. Where, you know, they're super excited. You know, it's like there's so many actinites all over this place. Do you know what that means? You know, and all that and just really getting it. You know, I made sure that our, you know, uh, point of view character uh, only has a master's. So could be sort of the the one that uh, everything gets explained to. But mm -hmm. um but having and just letting really smart people be really smart about the things that they're really smart about yeah. and also do their, you know, their jobs and have their personalities. So in one sense, no, I mean, you always want to have the range of personalities. Um, but it was a, an actual joy of just showing people who are like, isn't this cool? We get to be here and do this science and learn these things and you know share them with the other other people who are there it's very frustrating for a lot of them that they don't get to do like actual peer review uh yeah. and that they can't actually announce what what it is that they've learned because everybody is there is like um you know back home i would be picking up my nobel prize and i can't tell anyone yeah. but you know but in this but the adventure of uh, learning all this stuff and exploring this world and doing things that literally they wouldn't have a chance to do otherwise. Um, I think for most scientists or the people that I know who are scientists, that's catnip. Yeah. Like, you know, it's like you could have a Nobel prize or you could actually do the biology on these weird creatures that look like they're breaking the laws of physics, but aren't, which would you rather do? And they'd be like, Ugh. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. Do it for the science. Yeah. Well, Mary's got a great follow-up question to that. Do you really think that the secret of a parallel world concept could be kept, especially with so many bad actors who knew about it? Do you think that's possible? Oh, yeah. No, and this is something that, again, because uh, one of the things that I am very aware of, both as a huge consumer of popular culture uh, and being a nitpicky nerd myself, uh, our questions just like that, right? Mm -hmm. Is be like, oh, come on, you can't really expect everybody 
to do. And it actually gets addressed in the book, which is just yeah. like literally like, you know, we take their phones, you know, so they're not going to be like doing selfies and just me with the me with the kaiju living our best lives, you know, that sort of thing. They're not going to do that. But even if somebody did, um, they'd be like, OK, so you did that in Adobe After Effects. Yeah. Um, and Photoshop. yeah, exactly. It's not like it, it, th we live in an era where um, photography and uh, video and all that sort of stuff is so easily faked and people can be duped um, that at this point, even if you had you were there and you did the thing where you had the, you know, the parasites or the actual kaiju right there. Um, people would be like, no, I can see the pixels. I can see yeah. where they're going. Um, and so, uh, you know, this age of, of potential, you know, disinformation that we live in is also the thing that keeps it, you know, kind of under wraps. We're having that moment right now anyway with the, with the UFOs, right? You know, it's like we had hearings on the UFOs and they're like, I done seen them. I've seen the alien bodies. Like, did you, did you really? It's like, well, I heard someone talking about the alien bodies, you know? Um, and, and everybody's reaction is like, yeah, of course they're aliens, whatever, you know, uh, yeah. I got to pay rent. So, you know, yeah. um, and so my feeling about this is, just in the real world when we're like, you know, here's this evidence of, of UAPs, right? Uh, which is what we call UFOs now, apparently. Um, and people are like, yeah, I mean, that's probably just the Air Force, like, doing goofy things. And uh, I'm, I got other things that I actually are worried about. So um, I think that, in fact, you could uh, keep the secret not by, you know, silencing, you know, everybody who... Uh, you know, would talk about it, but just be like, yeah, I can see the pixels. I mean, what, I mean, wh which did you, did you use, did you use After Effects or did you use, did you, did you use Unreal uh, Engine 5? Because that looks great, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's, we're, we're full on just, uh, we live in a world of misinformation. And so we would be like, yeah. Sure. No, no. The way you, the way you would deny it is not to deny it, but just to be like that. Those are some really good special effects. I'm going to I'm going to hire you for my next movie because that's amazing. Yeah, it would be it wouldn't be a surprise to me if they ended up hiring someone who works in special and visual effects and just to keep up the ruse. Right. Exactly. Um, Steve has a great comment. Um, loved the scientist, but wanted Sanders and the general to be eaten, which I think uh -huh. is fantastic. Um, but I, I wonder in relation to this, is it fun to write characters that you know the readers are probably just gonna like see that the entire time they're reading? Oh yeah, no, I mean, you absolutely wanna have the people that, uh, you know, the character that readers love to hate, right? Um, you can't have every character be uh, a character that everybody loves, just loves and wants to hang out with and have a beer or a cookie with. You actually have to have some bad actors to, to move the plot along. Now, one of the things that I think that often um, is a legitimate criticism of me would be like, it's like, there's no doubt who your bad guys ever are, right? Because they're just plain bad. And I'm like, I understand that. And also, in the real world, there's no doubt who the bad guys are, right? There's not like, there's not really, um, we live in an era right now where uh, folks with really bad intentions are like, yeah, this is what I do. Uh, I'm just a bad person and, uh, and you just got to live with it. Cause I'm, cause I got a lot of money. Um, and in that being the case, um, I don't feel that the way that I'm portraying these particular characters, um, is, uh, especially, um, out of the realm of fiction. One of the things that we, we do say often, um, with the, the number of bad actors who are out there right now, and I'm not gonna name names simply because, you know, let's not, let's not get distracted. Um, but um, one of the things that people like to say about all the things that are happening right now with a number of bad actors are, it's like, I couldn't write that because if I wrote that, my editor would be like, that's too over the top. You can't, you can't do that. No one would believe it. And I'm just like, mm, no, now, you know, given uh, just how, baldly bad actory so many people are, uh, I'm not going to pretend to give them like sneaky noble motives and blah, 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 blah. I'm just going to make them evil, you know? So, and once again, um, I understand this. P people would be like, you could just make them less black and white. I'm just like, uh, do I have to? Do I have to? 
You know, the book is is how many pages? It is just just over two fifty. You don't have yes. time to yeah, well, give people all of these deep motivations. You well, know, but not only that, but point. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's like I do have the new book is the next one is called Start a Villain, right? Where it's like it's literally about villains and what do they want to do? They want to be bad guys. So I'm not going to. They got to start somewhere. Yeah. They gotta, yeah, they got to start somewhere. There. Are they going to have rich, complex in their lives? Yeah, sure. Why not? But, uh, but, but they're going to have them inside. So yeah. If you want, if you want great motivations of them being evil, go ahead and write the fanfic. I'm just going to have them go. Blah. I love that. Um, so you talked about the movies that inspired this book, but a few people, including Audrey, are wondering, are there any movie prospects for kaiju preservation? Might we see a representation of these animals on the big screen? It's currently under option for television. Um, and unfortunately, at this point, um, along with all the other things that I have under development, um, there are two strikes that are going on in Hollywood, one for the writers yeah. and one for the actors. Um, and you know, part of my brain is like, ah, oh, strikes, you're getting in the way of my, my art. Uh, and then the more realistic, actually, I'm a human, not a jerk um, reaction is uh, both the writers and actors are absolutely in the right and, and should be striking uh, because they're not only um, trying to like live their lives on a day-to-day -day basis and get paid fair wages for fair work, uh, but they're also setting the tone for how their relationships with studios and, and uh, movie production houses and stuff go for the next several years. And as much as it's annoying for me and for everybody else who wants to see my stuff get made, um, I would rather have my stuff done by people who are compensated fairly uh, and are uh, you know, happy to do the work they, uh, that they that they do, and with the knowledge that they they are getting paid, uh, that they have health insurance, um, that one day they'll be able to retire, um, than to basically have slave labor. So, uh, as far as it goes, um, a hundred percent support for the actors and the writers, um, and all the stuff that's in development can wait. Yeah, I think that's great. And I think you're right that it means that you know that the pro the project that is going to be up on the screen is a project that you also are really proud of for all of the behind the scenes reasons as well. Absol so cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that that's really important um, for me, at least as a, as a creator. I mean, I was, you know, I was the president of the science fiction fantasy writers uh, of America. Now it's the Science Fiction Fantasy Writers, Writers Association. Um, and honestly, if I was not sitting there saying, pay your writers fairly, you know, fairly uh, and make it so that they can earn a decent living, um, I believe with justification um, that I would just be dragged into hell. Uh, and, and it would be right for me to do so. <laughs> well, um, Ashley has a question about sort of your next project. So you just showed us a little bit about your next book, Starter Villain, which I'm very excited to read when it comes out next yeah. month in September, we're looking forward September to it. September 19th, yes. Amazing. Um, but they're wondering, you stated that KPS is quite different from your other books. Do you intend to write more like it? I mean, you didn't quite intend to write this one, right? right. Um, so the answer to that is both yes and no. Uh, at the moment, I don't have any KPS sequels planned. Although with Tor, my publisher came to me and said, let's make KPS 2. Here's a big pile of money. Um, I would seriously consider it because I like big piles of money. Mm -hmm. um, that said, <laughs> you're like you're laughing, you're like, oh, well, it I really, really you like, well, you kind of faked me out. I thought you were going to go with big giant uh, aliens with nuclear bodies, yeah. but sure. Yeah. <laughs> but no, so the, but the thing about it is, is actually, so uh, Start a Villain, which is, you know, right here, um, is not right. like uh, that in that there are no monsters in it or anything like that, but it is like it because like I mentioned with like red shirts or agents of the stars, um, it has a similar theme of average person uh, thrown into extraordinarily, extraordinary high concept circumstances um, with, you know, kind of an interesting cast of characters. And in the case of starter villain, um, the concept is average Joe um, down on his luck inherits mysterious uncle's uh, business and uh, that business just happens to be like James Bond level super villainy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and again, just like uh, in Kaiju where you're sitting there thinking, how do I make these, uh, you know, square cube law violating uh, creatures reasonable uh, by the same, by the same uh, uh, 
thinking I take all the tropes that are of supervillains and try to have a reason for them as well. Like for example, um, the volcano lair, because of course he has a volcano lair in Star Wars. Where else would you have a lair? Where else would you have a lair? And and but but the but the question is not is there a super is there a volcano lair? Because of course there is, but why is there a volcano lair? And mm -hmm. anybody who's probably in this audience, the sci fry. Um, uh, audience knows the answer, which is, ooh, 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 geothermal energy. And that's like 100% correct. So once again, you have the reason, you have the reasoning for all the tropes and you get to play with the tropes and you get to have fun uh, with all of that sort of stuff. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's great. It's great, great fun. So um, Kaiju and Starter Villain, and there will be one more book that I'm currently writing now, which I can't give any details about yet, um, are all basically that same idea. Ordinary people dealing with an extraordinary uh, circumstance, more or less in contemporary time. Um, and then in 2025, I'll write another Old Man's War book because it's the 20th anniversary of Old Man's War. Mm -hmm. um, but, but so we have this weird loose trilogy of contemporary high concept, uh, ordinary people uh, sort of books. And I'm actually really, it was completely accidental that it turned out that way, but I'm actually really happy that it is because I think they're a whole lot of fun. Amazing. It, they, this book was a whole lot of fun. Thank you so much, John, for writing it, for yep. joining us tonight. Um, we're just about out of time. So, um, is there anything else you want to let people know? You've got a lot of, you're going to be on tour soon. Where can people, I mean, uh, if you look here at the bottom of our screen, you can find John on his website. You have a very active blog, I will say, yes. yep. um, but on most socials at, at Scalzi or at J, J Scalzi, but um, cool. where can people find you in uh, the real world? So I, w I will indeed be all over the world um, in next month. I do a, a I think an eight day tour um, starting when the book comes out. Um, and I'll basically be traveling uh, from, uh, I start off in Scottsdale, Arizona, go up the West coast. Mm -hmm go to places that I haven't been before, like Wichita, which I'm actually really excited about. I've never oh, awesome. been there. Um, and a couple other places. Uh, I go off to Budapest, where I'm the guest of honor at the International Book Festival there, which is ridiculous and awesome. I'm very yeah, excited. Yeah, that's so cool. That. It is. And then I come back and I do a number of uh, book uh, fairs and conventions and, and stuff like that. Um, so I am literally all over the place. Whatever.scalzi.com, which is my blog, has the information about what the tour's at. The blog has been there for 25 years as of next month. Uh, of September. Congratulations. That's And then uh, on... Um, you know, on Twitter and uh, Facebook and Blue Sky, I'm at Scalzi on Threads and uh, Instagram. I'm Jay Scalzi, uh, and honestly, just put my name into Google; it will find me. So amazing! Yeah. Um, thank you again so much. This has been so fun to talk about this book, and I really hope that if anyone hasn't taken it in on their bookshelves. Um, I read it in like three days and I'm a very slow reader. So mm -hmm. um, this kept me going for um, a few uh, days when I was traveling. So oh, thank excellent. you again, yeah, You're thank you again so much for writing it. Um, well, if you wanna continue to be a part of the Science Friday Book Club, all of our amazing audience here tonight, you can do so by going to sciencefriday.com slash book club. You can find out everything we are doing this month for Kaiju Preservation Society. We have a community meeting next week where we'll just talk about the book a little bit more. We'll sit in a, a virtual room together and just say all the great things that we loved about it and other things that people will recommend for continued reading. So feel free to join us there. Um, next month, we are reading a book called Afterglow. It's a collection of short stories all about um, imagined climate futures. We're spending two months on specific books about climate change. So um, you asked for it and we delivered. So that's all I got for you all tonight. Thank you so much for being here, uh, our amazing audience. You've been great, amazing questions. John, thank you again so much for joining us tonight and uh, we'll see you again soon. Yes, absolutely. Thank you everybody for coming and watching us chat and uh, uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, it was a great joy. Have a great night, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.